Hey everybody, this is Brandon Ford, and welcome to another edition of the Blind Rage Podcast. This time around, we are watching Molly Ringwald, Patrick McGaw, and John Vernon in the 1995 erotic thriller, Malicious. And I am using the Lionsgate DVD as a source, uh, if you want to watch along. That will probably be your best bet, but... If you want to stream it, I'm sure it's on Prime. I can't say for sure, but there is a movie called Malicious on Tubi that is a totally different movie, so don't watch that. Anyway, before I get we get started with the movie, I want to get the plugs out of the way. Please check out my books in paperback and Kindle editions by going to Amazon.com or the Amazon app on your smartphone typing in Brandon Ford. Uh, you'll find a number of my titles, including my most recent thriller, He Wore a Leather Jacket. Uh, you also find The Mystery of Kelly Christopher, Progressive Entrapment, Dreams of Sharp Teeth, and a number of others, including, also included, is my Amazon author page. So you can follow me there and get notifications whenever I have a new book so and if you prefer audiobooks i am on audible so just go to audible.com or the audible app type in brandon ford you'll find several of my titles there at the time of this recording i have 10 10 audiobooks up if you don't already please follow me on instagram at writer brandon ford you can also follow me on Twitter at Brandon Ford. I'm also on Letterboxd at Brandon Ford. And if you have any questions, comments, concerns, critiques, criticisms, recommendations, feel free to email me directly at blindragepod81 at gmail.com. Lastly, Please don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. Rating only takes a few seconds, especially if you're on Apple Podcast. It's just three taps. Select a star rating, hit submit, and you're done. It helps with the algorithms for the podcast, gets me more exposure, and hopefully some more listeners. So... It all takes a couple seconds to just hit that drop down. And if you're feeling particularly nice, I would appreciate a short review. Unless you hate me, then please don't. I have self-esteem issues as it is. Um, okay. So, let's get started with Malicious. We're going to get... We're going to begin with a three, two one count as per usual all right here we go three two one play so we're beginning with some some home video footage with the main uh character doug playing baseball with his father and this actor's awful and I suppose because his father passes away that is what makes the Doug character so uh, so ambitious when it comes to baseball and wanting to play for the big leagues and such to make his father proud. But he also, I, I don't know. Uh, well, I don't, uh, yeah, he also studies uh, kinesiology. So I guess he's falling back on being a doctor. If he doesn't make it as a major league player. So. This was a first. For Molly Ringwald. 
And much like Drew Barrymore and Alyssa Milano before her, she decided to play against type uh, with a movie like this, an erotic thriller, in which she does have one nude scene. And uh, I think a lot of people were surprised by that because I doubt anybody expected Molly Ringwald to do a nude scene. And a couple, well, there's, I believe, only two sex scenes. And they're both kind of risque. And again, that's not something that you would expect Molly Ringwald to do. But I guess that was weird. She just said, guess who? I guess she was trying to... I don't know, uh, get some attention after she turned down what, what could have been a star making, well, another star, because her star was kind of on the downfall, downfall around 1990. Supposedly, I don't know, I've heard conflicting stories that she was offered Pretty Woman and I've heard others that she auditioned for it. But from what I heard, she was offered Pretty Woman and she turned it down because she didn't want to play a prostitute. And instead, she did the oh so forgettable Betsy's Wedding, which has Ali Sheedy, her co star in The Breakfast Club, with a cast like. Like that, though, you would think that Betsy's wedding would have done much better than it did and be more recognizable or memorable than it is because it's got, you know, Molly, it's got Allie, it's got Catherine O'Hara, it's got um, um, Alan Alda, uh, Catherine O'Hara, Joe Pesci, uh, Anthony LaPaglia a lot of decent names in it and um yeah i'm sure i'd be willing to bet that she's still kicking herself today for turning down that movie if things went down the way um so this is sarah lasses here who is uh I guess kind of frigid. I don't know. She's got some kind of sexual hang-ups, which is kind of unusual because they've been going together for three years, which you find out a little later. And I don't think they've even slept together. I don't really think they've done anything except for make out. And I guess that is supposed to, because he seems to really love Laura, Sarah Lass as his character, uh, he, he's supposed, it, it appears he really loves her. And I suppose because things aren't going so well sexually, we're supposed to believe that is why he just has that fling with Molly Ringwald's character, Melissa. This, his friend looks about 40 and sounds it too. Getting back to Sarah Lasses for a, few, a second. Um, a lot of a lot of people would know her from the very low budget horror uh, thriller The Clown at Midnight with uh, Margot Kidder and Christopher Plummer. And I don't think it has a, I don't think it has a DVD release or a Blu-ray release, but it does have something of a cult following. It's not one of my favorites. 
but it's okay. It, uh, it's, the title makes it sound more interesting than it actually is, but Sarah was in that. She played the lead girl on that, and she also, the only other movie besides that and this that I've seen her in was a very weird movie called Mad Cowgirl, which I couldn't even finish because it was so strange. It was very David Lynchian in that it was just weird for the sake of being weird and I couldn't follow it. And I just remember that out of nowhere, certain characters started speaking German for no reason. I don't know. It was just weird, a weird, weird movie. Now this is Laura's friend and she is a, another horrible fucking actress. Patrick McGaw is okay. He's a little stiff at times, but I think he's fine. The, of course, the standout performance is Molly Ringwald. John Vernon is barely even in this, and he was probably the second biggest name attached. Oh, Sarah Les has, I wanted to say, she wrote a book uh, a while ago, maybe 10, 15 years ago, maybe more than that, that I was curious about. It was called, I believe it's called Psychic Junkie. And it's all about her obsession with tarot cards and visiting psychics. And I think it's a collection of essays of everything that she'd experienced with um, those who claim to have the second sight, so to speak. Uh, I never got to read it, like I said, but it was something I was curious about. Here we have an introduction, introduction of Molly Ringwald. And... Uh, She's smoking these cigarettes that she that uh, she says are called American Heritage, that are all natural with no chemicals, and I think it was a play on a real cigarette. I, can't, I remember hear, hearing the name before. I think it's American something, not American Spirit. But it's America in some something or other. But I think I think they're they're similar in that they're all natural with no chemicals. But I want see this part here and this was beef I remember right after this came out, Mark McGuire blew up. Mark McGuire was all over the place. But at the time, I don't really think he really was as prominent in baseball. But yes, yeah, she says she likes his, his goatee because it makes him look like Mark McGuire. And she has this thing, I don't, I don't know from baseball, so forgive me, but she says something about RBIs or fucking whatever, the uh, Mark McGuire's accomplishments. She, she says that she's obsessed with baseball, but I don't think that she talks about baseball any other time. So I wonder if that was calculated, uh, that she had her, eye, that her, she had her sights set on him and she knew the best way to get to him was to talk about baseball because that's his thing. What do you want to know about it? Oh, she's asking about his girlfriend. Three years. Really? Serious? 
Yeah, I guess so. He said they'd be going out for three years, and she said, is that is it serious? No. No, it's not serious at all. Thanks for the cigarette. Hey, what's your hurry? She's very forward. I don't think so. I mean, you seem like a really nice person. But like I said, I'm seeing someone. I don't know why you're at this party with that or Mmm. Burn. So this was, you know, clearly supposed to be a play on the obsessive love movies like Fatal Attraction, which I think I talked about this before on another commentary, but it is perceived that Fatal Attraction was really the first real obsessive love uh, stalker movie type but actually you got to go back further to play misty for me and you see all of the tropes that end up in those movies in play misty for me so in a way fatal attraction was really ripping that off as opposed to all these other movies ripping off Fatal Attraction. But I think Fatal Attraction is more widely known and seen because of the risque sex scenes in it. And from what I remember, Play Misty for me doesn't really have much by way of uh, sex scenes. Um, But there, there were a ton of these movies. There were a ton of these movies um, in the years that followed and followed Fatal Attraction. I always consider the best example of it to be The Crush. And a lot of that has to do with Alicia Silverstone's performance. And... Yeah, so this was a time when a lot of obsessive love movies were coming out because of the success of Fatal Attraction, but also because of its uh, erotic thriller element. So there were... There were some other erotic thrillers, thrillers that were very successful like basic instinct that weren't necessarily obsessive love but because of that success and the success of fatal attraction they were blended a lot and i consider the early to mid to mid 90s to be the um the uh what do you call it the t I, I was going to go for something a little more eloquent but the time of the erotic thriller and we have a crane shot i believe this is a crane shot it starts out on a tight close-up of them fucking in the convertible in the pouring rain in the middle of the baseball field literally in the middle of the field how the hell they got the car in there i have no idea because i would think that it would be difficult to get a car i don't know again i don't know from baseball but i would think that it would be difficult to to get a car in there and i would think that it would be locked but i think there's a crane shot that pulls back yeah there's gotta be because you see you see the car from a high point 
and it's pouring rain. And I think this is supposed to be erotic in the same way that, you know, the scene, the kitchen scene in Fatal Attraction was erotic, or the elevator scene was, erotic, was supposed to be erotic. I don't know, this just seems kind of skeezy. And, um, Molly makes you wait before you see the boobage because you don't see anything here because Doug is on, uh, yeah, uh, Patrick McGall playing Doug is on top of her. And, uh, so yeah, um, anyway, so Malicious, I'm, 99.9% .9 sure was a straight to video release and I'd never heard of it I remember uh, hearing about it in in uh, well I didn't know about it when I first came out I heard about it in I remember in art class in ninth grade because in uh, in my ninth grade art class, we really didn't do anything. So it was just a, a, a period for the class to just bullshit. And um, a couple of girls who I would talk to during class who knew each other uh, from previous schools and were friends outside of school. Over, I guess it was on a Monday. So over the weekend, they had a, like a movie night with some friends and they had watched this and they were talking about it. And I was curious about it and I wanted to see it. But again, my, my video store didn't have it. And I didn't, I'm not sure exactly when I got to see it, but I don't think it was too far after. It might have been sometime early to mid uh 96 whenever cinemax started showing it so this was a canadian production so i think uh Patrick must be Canadian. There's, it was a Canadian production and a lot of it was shot in Canada, but I think some of it was shot in California. She's a TA. <laughs> um, yeah, the friend knows something's going on. Uh, Laura's friend. She knows something's going on because she's she sees. She saw him leave with her at the party and she sees the way he's interacting with her. And now, I think is when I think is when he no. Yeah, I think this is when he decides to take um, Melissa up on her offer to uh, help him with his fucking, I don't know what it is, uh, biology. He's not a good student. Um, he struggles a lot, but... Uh, 
I don't I don't know why he would take on something so ambitious as kinesiology if he's if he's really not good. So this is just to show you this is just a hint that um I think it's meant to make her sympathetic a sympathetic character because it's the first suggestion that she's being I believe physically, I don't know if sexually, but I believe she's being physically abused by her father. Please forgive me. It's been a long time since I've seen this, but I did watch it on a semi-regular basis around the time it first came out. So we're on the boat with, um, which I guess, because Melissa's family comes from money clearly so we're on the boat where they're studying and we're about to have the second sex scene which comes pretty soon after the first one oh maybe she maybe he she does know about baseball because she says her father was into it and was good enough for the pros but huh, then again my father is really into baseball and i don't know shit Yeah, father's a surgeon, so they definitely have some money. I'm not this open with everyone. I don't know, it's strange. I feel different with you. I'm sorry, I should just shut up. You the other night? Much like... I'm not usually like that. Brooke Shields, I think... I don't really know much about um, Molly's educational background, but I think she did, again, much like Brooke Shields, major in French literature because uh, Molly has something of a modest singing career jazz i believe she sings jazz and uh she does sing in french as well as english she's not a great singer she i remember i if you look up her her videos on youtube of her singing a lot of really good singers have this ability and i'm not you know i'm saying that i i know about this shit i have no vocal training i'm not a singer but this is just from my own ear real quick i want to say this before i finish my story um i think it's funny that they're fucking on the boat and you know after they get in the good boobage because you have to get the boobage because this is a big boob shot here this is what everybody's was paying for everybody's paying to see you know, um, Samantha from 16 Candles, as <laughs> she's gotten her boobies, um, <laughs> that was a line from 16 Candles, um, but yeah, I think it's funny when the camera pulls back and you see the boat kind of rocking back and forth, back and forth, because she's straddling him. And moving like kind of rhythmically in the same way as the boat and I just always thought that was funny I don't know if that was supposed to be intentional or not and what was I saying yeah so I think that she must be she's got to be she's definitely has to be fluent in French if she sings and she also translated a a French novel that is a gay uh a gay uh, love story called lie with me that wasn't very good i was really hoping for another call me by your name but call me by your name it was not and I don't really think it had anything to do with her translation. It just really wasn't a very compelling story. 
And what I was saying about her singing, um, a lot of singers, when they sing, their singing voice differs from their speaking voice. But when she sings, you can totally tell it's her because her voice really doesn't stray. Her singing voice doesn't really stray far from her talking voice. See, now she's giving him mixed signals here because he, first of all, he got, I was going to say it, then I wasn't going to say it, but now I'm just going to say it. He got his nut and he's done, you know, I mean, he, he's saying, you know, I have a girlfriend and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, she gets kind of pissed and she storms off smoking her cigarette. She's a fucking chain smoker and a half. And, um... She acts like she's done, but then she comes back again. Oh, he told his friend. I didn't, I forgot about that. I wouldn't want to be in your shoes right now, though. Your pants, I don't think you've been in pants, but I wear your shoes. What? You look like shit. What's the matter with you? What? <laughs> He said, I wouldn't want to be in your shoes right now. In your pants. I'd like to be in your pants, but I wouldn't want to be in your shoes. I mean, his friend said that. I know, I know what he meant, but what the fuck? That did, that did not come across as intended. I, I don't think at all. Because, you know, he's trying to say that Doug has these this female trouble that he would like to have himself fucking whatever i don't know it was just kind of funny I think that was supposed to show that Doug really doesn't know what he wants out of life or what he's going to do. And there she goes. She's calling. She hung up and called back. Melissa? It's Melissa. Oh, just hold on. Hello? I don't like being thrown away. <laughs> Fine. I, I'll call you back, okay? Do you still have my number? Yeah, I got it somewhere. Lord. This scene coming up where she throws the phone is a little over the top. I don't where this don't know where this is supposed to take place. Giants. As in San Francisco Giants. When 
did this happen? Coach told me about it today. Uh oh. Wait, she's gonna throw the phone. Hold on. <laughs> okay, that was a bit much. Molly, you could have taken it down a couple of notches there. Okay, so because he wanted to fool around a little bit with her in the library, she's now decided that she wants to lose her virginity in the library. What? Who the fuck loses their virginity in a library? I know that there are, there's John Vernon, R.I.P. Yeah, so I think he, yeah, he was a friend of um, Doug's father and because Doug's mother is having a difficult time with the passing of her husband and Doug's father, you know, John Vernon's character, Earl, John Vernon's character, Earl, uh, and his wife, um, make sure that they remain permanent fixtures in her life because, uh, You know, it's it's interesting because when it, he tells his friend that whose name I don't remember, he tells his friend that um, his mother's not doing so well. She talks about her father, his father, like he's still around. And um, but when you see her, she seems like she's completely together. Uh-oh. She's pulling up outside in the car phone. Something like that. I don't know why I just thought of this. But something like that happened. <laughs> well, uh, just in case you don't know what happened. But, uh, yeah, Melissa just called. And, um, yeah, he had his mother lie for him and say that he wasn't there but she's outside and she knows that he is but something something very similar happened when i worked in a, a, a department store um this this guy who i worked with i guess had a fling i don't know the whole story but i guess he had a, had a fling with this girl and she called to talk to him and he told a female co-worker to tell the girl on the phone that he wasn't there and she i just i'll, I'll never forget this she still uh, to this day she said well i'm looking right at him sweetheart and she was parked in the car right outside the fucking window like, literally parked right outside this door, like a psychopath.
Yeah, now they're gonna get their fuck on it in the f library, because that's so romantic. Did I finish what I was saying about the university libraries? I don't know if I did. But I know that there are some... Uh, I don't know if this is an urban legend or if this is true. And she's smoking in the library. Melissa's watching and she's smoking. Um, I don't know if this is true or not, but supposedly in every university library, there is an area where nobody goes because, I don't know, the books are out of date, fucking. And that is known as the area where people go to screw around. I don't know if they actually have sex, because that would be weird. But I guess they go to make out. I don't know. And now she's giving his finger a Bajowski, which is so classy. You think? Oh, this K, this part, I think, is kind of ridiculous. Oh, no, wrong. Wrong scene. See, I love this thing where he's supposed to make... He's in a biology class, I guess. Or fucking whatever. Um, um, he's supposed to be making a surgical incision on a cadaver. In f The professor tells him where on the body to make the incision. And then he turns around and walks away. And Melissa puts her hand on Doug's hand and makes the incision for him, basically. And then he, then the, te then the professor turns around again and says, "Very good." Now, if you wanted a student to make a very, sp a very specific incision on a cadaver, wouldn't you be watching? somebody saw i don't know if it i don't think it was i don't think it was um and now she's whispering answers to him Trying to think if there are any other movies of this kind that were centered around sports. Usually they have to have some kind of um, something uh, something that makes that makes it stand out from other movies of this of its kind. Otherwise, to make it seem less paint by numbers, but I can't, I can't recall, a, I can't recall, at least not off the top of my head, um, any other movies, erotic thrillers, obsessive love thrillers that are centered around sports or have sports as kind of a framing mechanism. I'm not saying that makes this one original or even good. It's I don't I don't think it's a good movie. It's 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 a decent time waster and it's interesting to see Molly Ringwald in this kind of role. But uh, for the most part, no. There's a reason it's it was straight to video. And I couldn't find any information about it at all as far as budget or um, 
anything like that there really was there there wasn't even a plot summary on wikipedia thankfully i'd already seen this a handful of times or more than that probably so i knew exactly what was what um but yeah there's a plot summary and there's no nothing about the production or it just Judy's here Judy, that's our friend's name. Okay, I'll do the same. All right, that was enough. That was good. Right, so now we're gonna have uh, Mel Melissa seems to um get into a lot of places without being seen and um okay that was the quickest shower known to man yeah she's able to get into places that are locked um Dad, you alone? she's able to get into places or she's able to remain in places on scene while she's smoking which is a dead giveaway and i don't think any i mean you know cigarette smoke travels i doubt that anybody in the library wouldn't have smelled that smoke especially doug who wasn't that far away so yeah now we're going to get the revelation of the tattoo with Doug's name on her chest, right, a, right, right above her breast. Judy is so bad. I could swear she's her dialogue is looped too. Look, I just want to get something straight with you, okay? Melissa. Don't be embarrassed. It's a good idea to smoke while you're smoking. Everything. I'm sorry you misunderstood. There's always, there has to be one of these things, scenes, rather. Well, I mean, I do think it's kind of messed up the way he slept with her twice and then all of a sudden wants nothing to do with her. But at the same time, she did throw herself at him. She made it very clear what she wanted. And what she wanted was a dick. Um, so... Yeah, and the tattoo is never mentioned again or never seen again, I don't think.
Another, another, um, wait a minute. Your bell's broken. Yes, I know. You must be Melissa. I am. And you must be Mrs. Gordon. It's nice to finally meet you. What can I do for you? Well, I'd like to speak with Doug. You do have to leave Doug. Oh, I'm sorry. Is it past his bedtime? Uh -uh. This is another example of uh, Melissa able to get in to places uh, pretty much any, anywhere she wants because soon she ends up uh, in Doug's living room. How she got in the house, I don't, I don't know. I think she's watching through the window now and she sees... Th this is the only really... This is the only real clue to... Um, Doug's mother having any kind of issues, mental issues, because she's taking sleeping pills. That, that's that's basically it. The rest of the time, she seems very much like she's got it together. You don't see her, like, crying or having manic episodes or anything like that. So for someone he who just lost her husband and someone Doug claims to not be handling things so well. She seems to be handling things just fine. This is essentially like a replay of the fucking opening title sequence because like they're they're playing they're playing the home video with Doug playing baseball as a kid and they're also playing that same like music box theme. One if you didn't know better, one would think that the Oh yeah, she's got a key. How the fuck she's got a key? I have no idea. Um so if you didn't know any better, one would think that that uh, music box uh, melody was in the actual home video. Well, if you're afraid that he gave you something, first of all, you're a medical student. Um, I think I would think you'd be smart enough to know to go to a doctor and get tested. Yeah. This is over the top, but I think it's supposed to be. This is so embarrassing. I'm sorry. Okay. Now we got the syringe. What she injected him with, I don't know. Um, okay, I think one of the weirdest, most nonsensical scenes is about to come up.
And she knocked him out just so she can give him kills. Wait a minute, I think it's coming up. Yeah, here it is. She takes his cat, kills it, brings it over to Laura's house, which is another place that she's able to get into, you know, without any trouble, and hangs it from the shower nozzle, which is a little, a little too weird and far-fetched. And what's even more far-fetched is when Laura goes into the bathroom and she sees the cat, she immediately knows it's his. Because she calls him and says, somebody killed your cat, it's here. I'd be like, what? And of course, you know, this is like going back to Fatal Attraction with the boiling of the rabbit. I mean... And we always have to have a scene where there's a scare that is strong enough to make somebody drop a glass. So not only did she go into Laura's shower, she went into Doug's shower just to leave the water running um, for no reason. How did she get him into bed? I would think that it would be difficult. I would think it would be difficult for little Molly Ringwald to be able to carry a grown man and put him in the bed. There's nobody. And I don't even think you would even know that he had a cat up until that point because I don't think that I, the cat is is really not very important to him. This just seems very, you know, um... What's the phrase? Fucking, um, just thrown. It's, it seems piecemeal. Like, fra it's all like a bunch of fragments from other movies. Here we have some more of her acting. Wait a second. There it is. I said get out. Wait. Didn't mean you son of a bitch, get the fuck out! Oh. Get out. Get out. Get out. Get out. Get out. Get out. This is also random. Or she's she's throwing herself all over the place. She's beating herself up, throwing herself down the stairs. She's smacking herself in the face with a with a cabinet door. Um, and then tells the police that Doug beat her up. This is I'm I'm pretty sure that this is yeah this is this is kind of similar to the scene in the crush when 
uh, Alicia Silverstone's character, Darian, you know, splits open her lip and, and kind of beats herself up and then claims um, Carrie always, his character, Nick, uh, sexually assaulted her. Yeah, so a lot of this is piecemeal, I think. Mm, he's distracted. Oh, how original. I don't know why I'm, I'm acting like I hate this movie because I don't. It's not like I said, it's not good, but it's it's just uh, it's easier to make fun of it now. I can't believe they still make these kinds of movies for a lifetime too. That is, is mind boggling to me. But Lifetime has been recycling the same storylines over and over and over and over and over again for years with their original movies. Or even doing remakes, which I think is hilarious. Remakes of TV movies. And this scene is also very similar to the scene in The Crush when uh, Carrie Elways' character is being interrogated. And it just so happens that John Vernon's character, Earl, works is a is, is an officer of the law so stay away from her she's the one that's following me okay okay let's drop that doug i didn't want to have to tell you this in here there's been an accident your mother's in the hospital <laughs> Yeah. There's just, I think there's too much, too much plot. There's so, there's so much garbled together that it's just, or gobbled together, whatever it is. Yeah, gobbled together or cobbled, fucking whatever. There's all these like, um, uh, tropes from other thrillers and it seems like they are put into the script one after another after another. Um, 
Mally Prin. High grade sleeping pills. I would be willing to bet they made that up. So, because Melissa is a med student, that means she has easy access to hard drugs. Uh, It's that woman. That was a weird line. Now, here's another trope that's not only in a million thrillers, but a million horror movies and all kinds of movies where we have a character doing uh, research uh, I guess in a library we have to have this exposition shouldn't have a movie like this without this kind of exposition Did you really find Now, what the fuck does that mean? So, the, the father beat Melissa up when she was 12, and he was brought up on charges, and then some years later, or the year before this, uh, um... Melissa has her mother committed. I, I don't want. Hi, I'm Laura Hutton. I need to speak to you about Melissa. My friend may be in danger. Yeah, I, of course. Laura's got to play Nancy Drew here. Now, why would she do this to the mother and, and not the father who was beating her up? It's about Melissa. I, one thing that I do like about this movie is, like, when, um, I mean, it only happens one, in one scene, but I think it should have been in this scene throughout the rest of the movie, but 
in this scene, like, she's supposed to be super crazy. So they give her this crazy eye makeup. Like, she really laid on the fucking mascara or whatever. And then she starts, of course, swinging a bat. So I think that because she attacks him, that exonerates Doug, I, 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 I guess. Uh, okay. All right, you're going way too long with this. I think she killed the father. I don't know. Some sh okay, yeah, coincidence. It just so happens that Doug shows up. What? Get the fuck out. is pissing me off. Yeah. Yeah, she did kill him. I think we're about to come up on another thriller trope where, yeah, we're about to come up on another th uh, thriller trope where the um, the stocky <clears throat> is almost killed by the villain and narrowly escapes. There are two things, two things that always bothered me about this scene. He gets, he's like, he falls asleep at the wheel, I think. Yeah, he falls asleep at the wheel. And it just so happens that Melissa's nearby and she pulls up. So he's stuck in the car because of, he's locked in with his seatbelt. So here she comes with her, yeah, here she comes. Now, there's some continuity because she pulls out a cigarette twice. I don't know why nobody caught that, but it was really fucking obvious. So there's that. And then when she decides to cut him loose, well, hello, you. she cuts him loose with what I'm 99% positive is a cheese knife. Instead of using a standard pocket knife or I don't, I don't know. Why? 
Wait, listen to this. Having you die like this wouldn't be very fun. And she had to think about that. And fun was the best thing she came up with. Really? Yeah, and of course there's a line of gas or stream of gasoline flowing toward the cigarette that she just threw down, of course. And he's going to run away and narrowly escape the explosion because this hasn't been done a million times before. Okay, so it was an attempt on his life. Okay, sure, but nobody saw it. <laughs> nobody saw it, much like nobody saw him be supposedly beat her up. So that was her word against his, and he wasn't believed. And now this is, they're just taking his word. Oh, she had to kill me. And they just believe him. I don't, I don't know. Okay, I never meant to hurt you. Not too cliche. I'm so sorry. This is so fucking random. This ridiculous song. And I remember the f I still remember this. The first time I saw this movie on when it, when I the first time I watched it when they premiered on Cinemax or whatever, I had to look at the channel and look at the remote because I thought, oh shit, did I change the channel? Because I was taping it. I was like, oh shit, did I change the channel? Oh no, I think I fucked it up. And then I saw him and I was like, oh, okay, th this is the movie. What? Okay. So Thanks. now well, I guess I'll see you in a couple weeks. Laura is in San Francisco well, going to Stanford. You know, this is a big place. You sure you don't want me as a roommate? I just need some time. Oh, she's going to get a roommate. <laughs> Melissa ending up being the roommate, I think, is the most far-fetched scene or moment in the entire movie. You done, Gordon? And there's a there's a lot of um, moments where you really, really have to suspend disbelief and just roll with it. Uh, 
I do kind of like this, though, that she's she calls him, but you don't know where she is. And then when he talks to Laura on the phone, you find out that's when you find out that then that Melissa's You're lying. there. It's true. I can't stop thinking about it. The first night in the car. The boat. I close my eyes and all I see is you. Melissa. I can't stop thinking about it either. Why do you care? Oh, Washington. Be there with you. They're looking for me. We'll have to be careful. I understand. Are you sure you want to do this? I do. Okay, swear. I swear. Now swear on Laura's life. Look, Melissa, do you want to be with me or not? I'll make you swear on Laura's life. I swear. Say the whole thing. I want to be with you, Melissa. I swear on Laura's life. That's better. Now tell me where you are. No, I'll come for you. Mm -hmm. She got a roommate pretty quickly. Yeah, only the fact that he told her that she was going to Stanford. Okay, so now is when you hang up the phone and you call the police and you say, Melissa moved in with Laura because Doug knows Laura's address. He knows where she lives. He helped her move in. So why can't he? And no, instead he gets in the fucking car and drives there. That makes a whole lot of sense. Uh, no. No, you call the local police, have the local police call the San Francisco police, have the San Francisco police go over to Laura's house and arrest Melissa. Thank you, movie's over. Oh, it's okay. I think there's some candles around here somewhere. It's a bunch of I still can't believe that. What did he do? Fuck some other girl? And he's driving from Washington to San Francisco. I don't know where in Washington he's supposed to be. I don't know what this part is supposed to be.
I think that... I think that Laura was supposed to be in the basement looking for a flashlight and Melissa locked the door, but that's not really clear. All you see, it just, it just cuts to Laura banging on the door saying, open, open the door, it's stuck. And then we cut to Melissa saying, let's talk about Doug's other girlfriend. And then Laura screaming. <laughs> this is so stupid. This is so fucking stupid. <laughs> I had no idea that this was going to turn into a, a riff tracks. A riff track, whatever. But I can't help but riff. Yeah, so a neighbor who doesn't even know anybody who lives in that house is smart enough to call the police, but Doug, no. Now, whose dog was that? And she kills this cop for no fucking reason. What's in here? Oh, that's my roommate's uh, storage space. She has the keys. She goes to the police tonight. Because he doesn't find anything. He doesn't suspect anything. He's just looking around. And then he sees a vase that his wife has, the same one, and Melissa clubs him with a bat. Which again was not smart on Melissa's part, excuse the rhyming there, because I mean, if they send an officer out to check on a disturbance, first of all, I don't think they go alone. They usually have a partner. And if, if he's not answering on his, on, he's not answering dispatch, they're going to know something's wrong. And they're going to send somebody looking for him. But for some reason, they don't. Just like for some reason, Doug didn't call the fucking police himself. Oh, is that Laura's dog? Yeah, he got there pretty quickly. Another so fucking cliched moment is coming up soon where um, Doug gets the gun, I think, from the cop and he thinks he's going to shoot her. And of course, she's got the bullets. Of course. Oh. What? What? What are you saying? I do like this delivery. Wait a minute. The, her, the faces that she makes are really good. 
And the way she tilts her head when she says, you're a killer now, is that it? And of course, it wouldn't be a thriller of its time without the villain, the villain plummeting to his or her death by falling out a window. And that fucking dog, which I believe was a German shepherd, did nothing. Some watchdog you are. Yeah, of course, now the police are there. The police are always there and everything's over. And that whole fight sequence was very rushed, eh, anticlimactic. very unsatisfying ending to a very <laughs> unsatisfying movie wow that was bad that was really bad i hadn't seen it so long that i forgot how bad it was jesus christ and this this theme is very uh basic instinct i must say and we have the of course, the the, the uh, saxophone, because it wouldn't be an erotic thriller without a saxophone. Oh, Jesus Christ. All right, I'm going to wrap it up now, but I want to thank you for staying with me until the bitter, bitter end. This has been Malicious, and I am Brandon Ford. And until next time, Unpleasant dreams.